to welcome you to our tour today. For those of you who don't know me very well, my name is Kelsey and I am originally from Chicago. And my husband and I moved to Valencia, Spain last February. We're loving it, it's beautiful. And I have been taking quite a few trips lately. So this is one of the beautiful places that I am so excited to bring you to. So let's go ahead and get started. Welcome to Alicante. Here is the video I took right outside the train station. You can see it says Alicante Terminal or Alicante Terminal. Alicante is a historic and vibrant city located on the southeastern coast of Spain in the Valencian community. I live in the city of Valencia, which is the capital, and it takes about two hours on a, on a fast train to get to Alicante. Alicante has rich roots dating back to ancient times with evidence of settlements by various cultures, including the Iberians and the Romans. During the Islamic period, in the Iberian Peninsula, Alicante was part of the Al-Andalus. It was known as La Cant. The city played an important role in trade and agriculture during this time. During the Christian Reconquista, Alicante was conquered by the Kingdom of Castile in the 13th century. The castle of Santa Barbara, which we will see today, is a fortress overlooking the city, and it was constructed during this period. Alicante experienced growth and economic development over the centuries and eventually became an important Mediterranean port. Alicante's economy has traditionally been tied to maritime activities, trade, and agriculture. In recent times, tourism has become a major economic driver due to the city's beautiful beaches, historic sites, favorable climate as we're seeing here. The castle of Santa Barbara, which is perched on the Mount Benet Cantil, offers panoramic views of the city and the Mediterranean. We will see this today, as well as the Explanada de España, which is a promenade lined with palm trees. It is a popular spot along the waterfront, which we will also walk along today. Alicante hosts various cultural events and festivals as well. One of the most famous is the festival of Las Hogueras de San Juan, where massive sculptures are created and burned in bonfires to celebrate the summer solstice. More info about this can be found in my Las Fallas tour. The link to this tour I will leave in the info about this video. Click it and you can see an hours long display of bonfires, incredible paper mache sculptures that are as tall as four story buildings, as well as some churros for all of you foodies out there. Alicante boasts several beautiful beaches as well, including the Playa de Postiguet, which is located near the city center, something we will also see today. Alicante does have an international airport. This connects the city with many European destinations, and it also has a well-developed public transit system, as we have talked about with how I arrived at the city that day. Alicante's rich history and contemporary vibrancy offers so much to explore. Let's see what we can find. Alicante has a population of just over 350,000 people, and it is the second largest city in the Valencian community, after the capital of Valencia. Now, off we go! Don't you find all of these beautiful things inspiring? Well, you're not the only one. Spain has a rich and diverse artistic heritage, with many famous artists who have made significant contributions to various art forms. Some of the most renowned artists in Spain are Pablo Picasso, who was one of the most influential artists of the 20th century, known for pioneering the Cubist movement and creating iconic works like Guernica. He was born in Malaga and spent most of his career in France, but remained deeply connected to his Spanish roots. Salvador Dali, who was a prominent surrealist artist known for his eccentric and imaginative works, born in Catalonia, and his paintings such as The Persistence of Memory are celebrated for their dreamlike quality. And Juan Miró, who is another prominent Catalan artist. He was known for his abstract and surrealist paintings. His works often feature playful, 
biomorphic shapes and vibrant colors. Who's your favorite? Let me know in the comments below. This is Plaza de los Luceros. This is one of the most iconic and central squares in Alicante. It is located in the heart of the city, making it a prominent and easily accessible location. This centerpiece of the square is the famous Monument to the Sun. It is a large bronze sculpture designed by the artist Jaume Sansano. Its sculpture represents the sun and its rays is a symbol of Alicante. The modern and abstract interpretation of the sun, conveying a sense of energy and radiance, is a symbol of vitality, warmth, and light. The artist, Jaume Sansano, he was born in Alicante in 1959, and he is known for his contemporary and innovative sculptures. His work often combines geometric shapes and organic forms, resulting in a visually striking piece like Monument to the Sun. Strategically placed in the center of Plaza de los Luceros, this is a focal point of the square, visible from various angles, and its presence enhances the aesthetics and identity of the square. The Monument to the Sun was inaugurated in 2003 as part of the revitalization of the Plaza de los Luceros. It serves as both an artistic monument and a symbol of Alicante. The square is surrounded by beautiful buildings, including elegant early 20th century architecture, which adds to its charms. Plaza de los Luceros is often used as a gathering place for various events and celebrations, including the New Year's Eve celebrations and cultural festivals like the Fayas Festival. It's a lively and vibrant spot during these occasions. The square has a historical importance in Alicante and has witnessed the city's growth and development over the years. While we explore, let's talk about some fun facts about Spain. We'll explore these on a more in-depth basis soon. The siesta culture. Spain is known for its siesta tradition, where many businesses and shops close in the afternoon for a few hours to allow people to rest and escape the heat of the day. And in Spain, there is a lot of heat. <laughs> the flamenco dance. Flamenco is a traditional type of Spanish music and dance style that originates from the Andalusian region. It's famous for its passionate, raw, and expressive performances. La Tomatina. Some of you might have gone to the Tomatina Festival with me, but let me tell you a little bit more about it. Spain hosts the world's largest food fight, as they say, called La Tomatina. And as you can guess, participants are throwing tomatoes, hence the name, at each other in the small town off Valencia called Buñol. Bullfighting. Although controversial, bullfighting is a traditional Spanish spectacle, with the most famous events being held during the running of the bulls in Pamplona. Multiple languages. Spain has several official languages, including Spanish or Castilian, Catalan, Galician, and Basque. Catalan is spoken in Catalonia, while well, Basque is unique to the Basque country. Paella. Paella is a popular Spanish dish originating from the Valencian region. It typically includes rice, saffron, and a variety of ingredients. There's seafood, but there's also chicken and snails, or simply vegetables. A diverse geography. Spain has a diverse landscape, from beautiful beaches along the coastlines to the mountainous regions of the Pyrenees and the Sierra Nevada. It also has semi-arid deserts, like the Tabernas Desert. Famous artists. Spain has produced many renowned artists, including Pablo Picasso, Salvador Dalí, who made significant contributions to the world of art. La Sagrada Familia. 
as many of you know, who came with me on our La Sagrada Familia tour. This famous basilica in Barcelona, designed by architect Antoni Gaudi, has been under construction since 1882, and it's still not even finished. It is an architectural masterpiece. The link to this tour can be found in the information below this video in case you'd like more information on this amazing cathedral. Tapas. Tapas are a beloved Spanish culinary tradition where small, flavorful dishes are served alongside drinks. And in Spain, there are many drinks. It's a great way to sample various Spanish foods. These are just a few of the fascinating facts and history about Spain. A country rich in culture, history, and tradition. This is the central market of Alicante, known as Mercado Central, and it is a historic and bustling market located in the heart of the city. The Mercado Central was built between 1911 and 1912 during a period of architectural development in Alicante. It was designed by architect Francisco Fajarado Elizo. The, the market is a notable example of modernist architecture, characterized by its use of ornamental elements, ironwork, and stained glass. It showcases the architectural trends of the early 20th century. When it was constructed, the market served as a central hub for buying and selling fresh produce, seafood, meat, and other food items. It played, and still does play, a vital role in the daily life of the city. The Mercado Central boasts a stunning facade with colorful mosaics and decorative details. Its iron structure and large stained glass windows add to its architectural charm. Inside, you'll find a spacious and vibrant market hall with numerous stalls selling a wide variety of fresh and local produce. It's a great place to experience the tastes and flavors of Alicante. The market underwent a significant restoration in the early 21st century to preserve its architectural heritage and update its facilities to modern standards while maintaining its historic character. Alicante's Central Market is an excellent place to discover regional culinary delights, including fresh seafood, fruits, vegetables, spices, local cheeses. It's a paradise for food enthusiasts, or foodies like you and me. Beyond shopping for groceries, though, visiting the Mercado Central is an opportunity to immerse yourself in the local culture and witness the daily life of Alicante residents. Additionally, the market hosts special events such as food tastings, cultural exhibitions, and culinary workshops, providing visitors with a deeper understanding of Spanish cuisine. The Mercado Central in Alicante stands as not only a place to shop for fresh and local ingredients, but also a historical and architectural gem that showcases the city's cultural heritage. It is a vibrant hub where past and present converge, offering a unique and enjoyable experience for everyone. While we explore, let me give you a bit of history on the cherished and iconic Spanish delicacy, Iberian ham. The production of cured ham in the Iberian Peninsula dates back thousands of years, possibly to pre-Roman times. The process of air drying and, and curing pork was developed as a method of meat preservation. The quality and flavor of jamón ibérico, or Iberian ham, are closely tied to the Iberian pig breed, which is native to the Iberian Peninsula. These pigs are known for their unique genetics, with intramuscular fat that contributes to the ham's marbling and distinctive taste. Traditional methods of curing Iberian ham involve a careful balance of salt, air drying, and aging in natural conditions, as well as caring for the pigs with their unique lifestyle, diet, and care, which contribute to the exceptional flavor and quality of the ham. Some of the ham is aged for several years, resulting in complex flavors. Iberian ham comes in various grades, primarily based on the pig's diet and breed. The highest quality is jamón ibérico de bayota, which comes from pigs that have feasted on acorns, bayotas, during their last months. This diet gives the ham a nutty and rich flavor. The intramuscular fat in Iberian ham is responsible for its marbled appearance and succulent texture. The fat melts at a lower temperature, enhancing the ham's mouthfeel. 
Spain has several regions known for producing exceptional Iberian ham. Some of the most famous include Huebla, Salamanca, and Dehesa de Extremadura. Iberian ham is deeply embedded in Spanish culture and cuisine. It is often enjoyed as a tapa in sandwiches or as a standalone delicacy. Special occasions and celebrations frequently feature jamón ibérico. Iberian ham has gained international acclaim for its unique taste and quality. It's a sought-after product in gourmet circles worldwide. Some varieties of Iberian ham have received PDO, or Protected Designation of Origin Status, which certifies their origin and product production methods, ensuring quality and authenticity. Iberian hams are often sold as whole legs, and they are an iconic sight in Spanish markets and restaurants. They require special ham holders and slicing techniques to enjoy properly. Beyond its consumption as a standalone dish, jamón ibérico is a versatile ingredient in Spanish cuisine, adding depth of flavor to dishes like paella, croquetas, and salads. Iberian ham is not just a food, it's a cultural treasure in Spain, celebrated for its artisanal products, unique flavors, and enduring significance in Spanish culinary traditions. And as an animal lover, I very much appreciate how well the pigs are treated at their early stages of life. Speaking of the pigs, let me tell you a little bit more. The treatment and diet of Iberian pigs are crucial factors in the production of high quality jamón ibérico. These pigs are renowned for their unique lifestyle, diet, and care, which contribute to the exceptional flavor and quality of the ham. Iberian pigs are typically raised in extensive, free-range environments. They roam through oak forests, pasture lands known as the Hesas, which are abundant in southwestern Spain. And their free-range lifestyle allows for Iberian pigs to get plenty of exercise, which results in well-developed muscles and better marbling in the meat. The most highly prized jamón ibérico, known as jamón ibérico de bayota, bellota, comes from pigs that have a diet primarily based in acorns, or bellotas, during their final months before their life comes to an end, shall we say. <laughs> the acorn-rich diet imparts a distinct nutty flavor to the ham. In addition to acorns, these pigs graze on grasses, herbs, and other vegetation found in the dehesa. This diverse diet also contributes to the complexity of flavors in the meat. Some Iberian pigs are fed a combination of grain and foraged vegetation. While not considered to be de bellota, these hams are still of high quality. The pigs are raised in a healthy and natural environment, which is essential for their overall well-being. Stress can negatively impact the quality of the meat, so efforts are made to ensure pigs live a stress-free life, full of acorns, peaches, peanuts. Sounds like a pretty good thing to me. Also, their age of the end comes later. Iberian pigs are typically slaughtered at a later age compared to other pig breeds, allowing them to develop the desired levels of intramuscular fat and flavor, not to mention living a somewhat full life. The treatment of Iberian pigs and their diets are key elements in the production of exceptional, exceptional jamón ibérico, the combination of a natural, free-range lifestyle and a diet rich in acorns or a varied forage diet results in hams with unique and sought-after flavors, making them a prized delicacy in Spanish cuisine. Efforts are made to maintain these traditional and sustainable practices while adhering to modern standards and regulations. As we walk, let's talk a little bit about the Spanish lifestyle. The lifestyle in Spain is deeply influenced by the country's rich history, which spans millennia. Spain's history includes Roman, Moorish, Christian, and other cultural influences, resulting in a diverse and unique way of life. For centuries, Spain was a global colonial power, shaping its culture and traditions, and today it remains a vibrant and dynamic nation with a lifestyle that reflects its complex past. The Spanish lifestyle gives great importance to family, community, and leisure. Sounds good, doesn't it? <laughs> the concept of familia, as they say here, is central, with extended families often living close together and frequently gathering for meals and celebrations. I have a friend who is over 30 and still lives with his parents. He says he will move out when he meets the person he wants to marry. 
it is common here for young people to live with their parents until they move in with their future spouse. Spanish communities, from small villages to large cities, often have a strong sense of local identity, and festivals and traditions play a vital role in bringing people together. Spain boasts the Mediterranean lifestyle, so this is known for its emphasis on leisure, so siesta culture, a strong work-life balance, a really nice quality of life. Spain's climate and geography contribute to this lifestyle, though, with many Spaniards enjoying outdoor activities like hiking, swimming, and outdoor dining. Most people here eat their meals outside on a daily basis. Statistics indicate that Spain has one of the highest life expectancies in the world, partly attributed to its Mediterranean diet and relaxed pace of life. Stress is a huge indicator, and here, there's not a lot of it. The siesta tradition. As we spoke about, the siesta, which is the short afternoon nap, is a famous part of Spanish life. Many businesses close for a few hours in the afternoon to allow people to escape the heat and recharge, emphasizing this value of rest and relaxation. Spain is also renowned for its culinary culture, which goes beyond paella and tapas, although they are delicious. Each region has its own specialty dishes, such as Catalonia's seafood paella, Basque country's pinchos, and Andalusia's gazpacho, the cold tomato soup. Spain is also known for its vibrant festivals and traditions, including La Tomatina, the world's largest tomato fight, Semana Santa, which is the Holy Week processions, and the running of the bulls in Pamplona. These various festivals are just part of Spain's vibrant but relaxed way of life. Late dining is also something of note. It's common for Spaniards to have dinner late into the evening, often well past 9 or 10 p.m. This allows for extended socializing and a leisurely approach to meals. Spain's favorable climate also encourages this outdoor lifestyle. Like we talked about, sidewalk cafes, park, and plazas are bustling with activity year-round, making it easy to enjoy the fresh air and sunshine while you have tapas or your evening meal with your family. Spaniards also have a strong sense of regional identity. This can be seen in their regional languages, the traditions, and the cuisines. Catalonia, the Basque Country, Galicia, and other regions have distinct cultures within Spain. Not to mention the language. The Spanish language is not just a means of communication. It's an integral part of the Spanish lifestyle. The importance of family and community is often reflected in the language's use of familiar and formal forms of address. The Spanish lifestyle is a harmonious blend of tradition and modernity, with a strong focus on family, community, and enjoying life's pleasures. Its rich cultural tapestry, diverse regional identities, and celebration of leisure and culinary delights make it a captivating and vibrant way of life. We are walking along San Francisco Street, known as the Mushroom Street, as you'll shortly see why. It has become a must for tourists who visit Alicante. This street is in the traditional center of Alicante, known for its decoration of mushrooms as trees, turning this street into a place something out of a fantasy world. This new look of San Francisco Street is full of history. The installation of these mushrooms started in late 2013 as an initiative of the city of Alicante in order to give life and help the businesses of the city and the area, which had begun to decline because of having become forgotten, for lack of a better word, with just a few businesses here. The San Francisco Street currently, though, has more than 50 shops, including restaurants, souvenir shops, fun clothing options. Very appetizing and fresh juices and croquettes can be enjoyed on this street or along the beach or along the park or even in your hand as you wander through the city center. The current Mushroom Street has become a typical image of Alicante, a place you should not miss if you have come to enjoy the full wonders of Alicante. And don't forget to take a selfie next to these fun mushrooms! Now Spain is so hot, 
Some places get over 120 degrees Fahrenheit or around 45 to 50 degrees Celsius in the summers and 300 to 320 days of sunshine per year. It is really hot in Spain. Doesn't it make you want to just rip your clothes off and sit under a fan? Well, you're not the only one. Nudity in Spain, like many other parts of the world, has a complex history and cultural significance here, especially in the legal context. But nudity in Spain dates back to ancient times. The influence of the Roman Empire introduced a culture of communal baths and public nudity. With the spread of Christianity, however, nudity came to be associated with a sin and was discouraged. During the Inquisition and the subsequent conservatism of the Franco era, public nudity was heavily censored and frowned upon. Yet, Spain's climate with its sunny beaches has always encouraged a relaxed attitude toward clothing, especially in the coastal regions. Now, mind you, you're not going to walk around and see people going to the supermarket nude. Although actually there was one guy in Barcelona who did that and almost got arrested four times, but he wasn't acting in an inappropriate manner. He just simply only wanted to wear shoes and a fanny pack. Why the fanny pack? Well, he needed some place to put his wallet. <laughs> Here I had some Indian food for lunch. It had three courses and was quite delicious. I found the lunch prices in Alicante to be quite affordable, so I decided to splurge and have one of my favorite types of foods. Not particularly Spanish, but definitely delicious. Here we are walking along the Explanada de España. This is a beautiful and iconic promenade in Alicante. The Explanada was built in 1957 by the architect Javier de Juan Martínez. It is located along the waterfront and runs parallel to the port of Alicante. This promenade was designed with a unique mosaic pattern using over 6 million marble tiles. The design, as you can see, includes a wave-like pattern representing the nearby Mediterranean Sea, of course. The explanada is lined with over 400 palm trees, providing shade and adding to the scenic atmosphere. The marble tiles create a vibrant and visually appealing walkway, and they often form intricate patterns, including this wave design that represents the sea, but also stars and different forms of fish. It's really beautiful. Along the explanada, there are stalls where artisans and merchants can sell handmade crafts, souvenirs, and local products. It's a popular spot for both tourists and locals. It is centrally, centrally located, connecting the city center with the port and the waterfront. It's a prominent meeting place and a hub for social activities, events, and celebrations. The promenade offers stunning views of the marina, the sea, and also the incredible castle. The Explanada de España is not only an architectural and artistic landmark, but also a beloved public space that captures the essence of Alicante's coastal charm. Now let's head up a little bit higher and talk about this incredible castle that offers stunning views of the city and the water. The Castle of Santa Barbara, or the Castillo de Santa Barbara, is a prominent historical fortress that dominates the skyline of Alicante. The site of this castle has a history dating back to ancient times, likely used by various cultures, including the Iberians and the Romans. However, the current fortress has its roots in the medieval period. During the Islamic rule of the Iberian Peninsula, the castle was known as Lacant, and it played a strategic role in the defense of this region. The name Santa Barbara was given to the fortress after the Christian Reconquista. This castle was captured by the forces of Castile in the 13th century during the Christian Reconquista. After the conquest of Alicante in 1248 by Alfonso X, this castle underwent renovations and expansions under subsequent rulers. Over the centuries, this castle has seen various modifications and uses, 
Here, you can see a picture of the castle in the 19th century. This photo was taken by Jean Laurent, who was born in 1816 and died in 1868, just to give you an idea as to how old this photo is. The location of this castle, it is perched on Mount Benahuacantil, and the castle of Santa Barbara offers panoramic views of Alicante, the Mediterranean Sea, and the surrounding landscapes. The castle exhibits a mix of architectural styles reflecting its long history, and visitors can explore different sections, including the tower, the walls, and the keep. You can reach the castle either by a scenic walk or by an elevator. It's called the Postiquet Elevator, and it cuts through the mountain, providing easy access for visitors. The castle hosts exhibitions and cultural events, making it not just a historical site, but also a cultural hub. The viewpoint from the castle, though, offers breathtaking views of Alicante, as you can see, making it a popular destination for both tourists and locals. The Castle of Santa Barbara stands as a symbol of Alicante's rich history, providing a tangible link to its medieval past, while offering visitors a chance to appreciate its strategic significance and enjoy the stunning views. Now, let me give you a little bit of background and history about the Moorish conquest here. Also known as the Islamic conquest of the Iberian Peninsula, the Moorish conquest was a significant historical event that spanned several centuries. It began in the 8th century when Muslim forces led by Umayyad Caliphate crossed the Strait of Gibraltar from North Africa and invaded the Iberian Peninsula. The conquest marked the beginning of the Islamic rule in parts of modern-day Spain and Portugal. The Moors, who were of Berber and Arab descent, introduced a rich culture and intellectual heritage to the region. The Moorish conquest had profound and lasting effects on the Iberian Peninsula. It resulted in a period of culture and intellectual flourishing known as Al-Andalus, which is where we get the name Andalusia, by the way, where Muslims, the Jewish population, and Christians coexisted and contributed to a vibrant, peaceful society. This era saw advancements in science, medicine, philosophy, and architecture, with notable figures like Aberroes and Maimonides emerging as influential scholars. The architectural legacy of the Moors is still visible today in landmarks such as the Alhambra of Granada and the Mesquita in Córdoba. The Moorish conquest gradually expanded across the Iberian Peninsula, with the Umayyad Caliphate establishing the Emirate of Al-Andalus in the 8th century. Over time, Al-Andalus fragmented into various smaller Muslim-ruled territories, known as Taifas, due to internal conflicts. This fragmentation eventually allowed Christian kingdoms in the north to launch the Reconquista, a centuries-long effort to retake the Iberian Peninsula. Now, I found some interesting facts for us about this time. During the height of Al-Andalus, this region was known for its religious tolerance and coexistence. Muslims, the Jewish population, and Christians often lived side by side and scholars from various backgrounds collaborated on intellectual pursuits. This period is often cited as an example of interfaith coexistence in history. The Moors also left an indelible mark on Iberian architecture. We can see this all over Spain, but especially in the south, places like Alhambra, a great palace and fortress complex, in Granada is celebrated for its stunning Islamic design and intricate tile work. The Mesquita in Córdoba also is a former mosque with a unique blend of Islamic and Christian architecture. The Al-Andalus was a center of scientific innovation during the Middle Ages also. Scholars in the region made significant contributions to fields such as astronomy, mathematics, and medicine. Their works were later translated into Latin and influenced European Renaissance thinkers. The Christian Reconquista gradually reclaimed territory from the Moors, leading to the eventual fall of the Nazareth dynasty in Granada in 1492. 
This marked the end of Muslim rule in Spain with the surrender of Boabdil, the last Nazarid ruler. The legacy of the Moorish conquest lives on in modern Spain, though, particularly in its culture, cuisine, and architecture. Moorish influences can be seen in traditional Spanish dishes, such as paella, and in the intricate tile work and arches of many historic buildings. The Moorish conquest of the Iberian Peninsula was a complex and transformative period in history, characterized by cultural exchange, intellectual growth, and architectural splendor. The legacy of Al-Andalus continues to shape Spain's cultural identity and heritage to this day. Some details for you on the Moorish influence on architecture. It is characterized by its distinctive features and intricate details. So first, the Moorish architecture is renowned for its intricate geometric patterns. We see this all over Spain. These patterns often feature interlocking designs, including stars, hexagons. These motifs can be found on tiles, plasterwork, and even in the layout of gardens and courtyards. The arches are particularly beautiful. Moorish arches are a prominent feature in their architectural designs. This horseshoe arch, known as the, quote, Moorish arch, is a classic example. These arches have a distinct shape resembling an inverted horseshoe, and they can be seen in doorways and windows, interior spaces, all over. Moorish architecture often incorporated the courtyards and the gardens as part of the integral elements of the design of the space also. These areas are typically adorned with fountains reflecting pools and lush vegetation. The Alhambra in Granada, for example, is a famous area that exemplifies this concept with stunning general life gardens that should not be missed. The stucco and plaster work are also very interesting. Elaborate stucco and plaster work are hallmarks of Moorish architecture. The intricate lace-like patterns are meticulously carved into plaster surfaces, creating a stunning visual effect. These can be observed on walls, ceilings, and even on domes. In terms of the mosaic tile work, Moorish buildings often feature these zelige in Morocco, which are mosaic tile work patterns. These colorful tiles are arranged in geometric and floral patterns, creating breathtaking displays on walls, floors, fountains, uh, windows, door frames. Very, very beautiful and much more popular than one might think all over Spain. This is the Basilica of Santa Maria. It is the oldest, oldest active church in Alicante. It was built in the Valencian Gothic style between the 14th and the 16th centuries over the remains of a mosque. This basilica is composed from a single nave with six side chapels located between the buttresses. In 2007, by request of the city of Alicante to the Holy See, the church was promoted to the rank of a basilica. Look at how beautiful these limestone details and columns. While we explore, let me tell you about some of the interesting laws that you might encounter in Spain. Some of them might not actively be enforced, but technically they still exist. It is illegal to drive in Spain while wearing flip-flops or technically any footwear that doesn't provide proper grip and control. This is rarely enforced, especially in the summer months when flip-flops are popular, but it's still a law. No honking your horn. Honking your car horn in a residential area between 11 p.m. and 7 a.m. is prohibited unless it's an emergency. However, where I live in Valencia, you are fined upwards of 80 euros if you use your horn at all, any time of day, unless it is a provable emergency. No kissing in train stations. In some train stations, public displays of affection, including giving your person a smooch, are discouraged and even prohibited. This 
is to ensure the smooth flow of passengers. In some regions, women participating in traditional parades are not allowed to wear high heels. Are they worried about their feet? No. It is because technically high heels could damage these hundreds, thousands of years old streets. It is to protect the public property. In order to preserve the cleanliness and beauty of public spaces, technically it is illegal to eat and drink in certain squares. This not only keeps the cleanliness con under control, but it also does not attract as many pigeons as the number that could be attracted to a lot of tourists eating and dropping sandwiches and spreading popcorn. You get the idea. No eating in some public places in Spain. And if you do, at least be clean about it. In coastal cities, there is no feeding of the birds, especially on the beach. This is discouraged, but in many places, prohibited by law in order to reduce the presence of these birds who are starting to rely on human food for their sustenance. Silence on public transportation. Many Spanish cities have rules against loud music or loud phone conversations without headphones on public transportation in order to maintain a peaceful environment. Now, I have to say, this is one of those laws that I don't think is very strictly enforced, but not by the demographic you might think. Younger folks normally do have headphones on. It is often the retired folks or the grandparent generation who are possibly losing their hearing and they don't realize that their cell phone is on speaker and that they are shouting into their phones. <laughs> Last but not least, you are not allowed to fish with explosives. Fishing with dynamite or other types of explosives is, of course, illegal as it poses significant risk to marine life and safety. As someone who does not fish, I did not know that we needed to make a law for this. But alas, here we are. So remember that while these laws might be on the books, enforcement can vary. And some may be rarely enforced, and maybe that's for the better. It's always a good idea to be aware of local regulations and customs when visiting or living in a particular area when you travel. You might see some pets as we walk around today, so let me give you some fun facts about pet ownership in Spain. It has a long and intertwined history with the culture and lifestyle of the Spanish people. Pets, that is. Historically, dogs were often used for working purposes, such as herding livestock or guarding property. However, over time, pets, particularly cute little cats and dogs, have become cherished companions and integral members of Spanish households. This shift reflects the broader global trends of urbanization and changing attitudes about animals. Now, in Spain, you can't ask a tenant if they have a cat. Why? Because a cat is considered to be a part of the family. In other words, it'd be like asking how many children they have. It's irrelevant for the price of the apartment and they can't charge more. However, landlords can ask about dogs and that is what is mainly being asked when landlords inquire if you have a quote pet or not they are actually asking if you have a dog. Fish, lizards, gerbils, birds are all a gray area. However, back to the subject. Pet ownership holds significant importance in Spanish society. They provide companionship, emotional support, a source of joy, of course, and they contribute to the overall well-being of pet owners. They also act the act of caring for pets promotes responsibility and empathy, particularly among children. Now this is true everywhere, but in Spain particularly, over 40% of Spanish households have at least one pet. Dogs are the most common pet, followed by cats, 
and then with a growing interest in adopting smaller animals like rabbits or guinea pigs or hamsters. There's also a significant stray animal initiative here. They have just recently outlawed buying cats and dogs in the way that you might go to the pet shop to buy a lizard. You must only now get them from animal shelters or private breeders, but I would highly recommend to only shop at shelters or adopt, don't shop, as they say. the delicious gelato that I had to celebrate all of the fun that I had in Alicante. Thank you all so much for joining me here. One last piece of interesting info for you is that the word Alicante comes from the al lacant, which reflects the Latin mucentum, or the Greek root of leuca, which means white. In other words, the white beaches is what Alicante is named after. I hope you had a wonderful time enjoying this beautiful city with me, and I hope to see you next time. Thank you all so much for coming. Thank you for your donations, for your tips, for your PayPal's, and as always, thank you for being a part of my traveling family. I look forward to seeing you soon. Bye, everyone. Don't forget to follow and like this video for more with me, Explore with Kelsey.